passionate about empowering community leaders to be global game changers. Woo! Very well. So, if any of you are community leaders and you want to become global, I have a t-shirt which is my slogan which says, Think huge, thinking big is so last century. <laughs> we need huge thinkers because we have huge problems and nature will respond. Okay, Rachel, why don't you share what's your passion? Well, there's too many things. I can't answer that in one sentence. Um, I am passionate about regenerative agriculture. I am passionate about a healthy and affordable food for all. I am passionate about mandatory GMO labeling. And I think most of all, I am passionate about empowering young people and youth activists to take change in this ever-developing world and where we need more and more activists of all ages, but especially youth because we are the future to take action. Well, thank you. Thank you, excellent. Okay, all the people take the microphone. Yeah, how do you pronounce your name? Oh, it rhymes with? Oh. It's spelled out and it's pronounced oh. It's, it, yeah, it rhymes with globe. Okay, so Zen wants to create community leaders to become oval, uh, oval change makers. Okay, um, what do you tell us what you're passionate about? Okay, so I'm passionate about our elected representatives um, putting our interests, citizen interests, before the interests of corporations. And I'm also passionate about eating delicious food. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Howard, your chance to share what you're passionate about. I'm Howard Bligger, and I'm passionate about the future for my grandchildren's generation. Beautiful. They need help. So now I want to ask the panelists, thank you, Howard. I spoke over your applause, I'm sorry. Um, Howard, I want to ask each of you to briefly give a very big, very short thumbnail about what, why you're here, what, who you are, a little bit of bio, just a short bio, and end by saying, and the one thing I want you to know, and the one thing I want you to know, and don't think about it, just get your bio and then start that sentence and see what comes out. Because you'll be talking about yourself, you'll be talking about what you're doing, but then there's that one thing you want people to know. I guess I'm first now. Um, so my name is Rachel Parent. Uh, I'm a youth activist. I have run an organization called Kids Right to Know, which I started when I was 12. Um, and I found out about GMOs from a very young age and was concerned about the potential health and environmental risks of these genetically modified foods, as well as the pesticides and herbicides that come along with it. And I felt as though I needed to do something. So it started off with a very small Twitter account which led to uh, running a website, to running a nonprofit, uh, which led to debating Kevin O'Leary, and uh, everything has happened since then. It's been such an incredible journey. And what I want you to know is that we need to eat food that is representative of the kind of world we want to see 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now. Based off of the kind of future that we want to see, we need to make our food choices properly. Hi, I'm Zen Hanikat, and I'm the founding executive director of Moms Across America. We're a national coalition of unstoppable moms, a nonprofit, 501c3 nonprofit, and our motto is Empower Moms Healthy Kids. And I got started doing this because my kids were sick. I found out about GMOs from Robert O'Brien and Jeffrey Smith, and got active in Prop 37 um, due to Pam Larry and the GMO labeling initiative and created Moms Across America out of asking what could I do to raise more awareness about GMOs. We began to march on 4th of July parades and have events and we now reach 1.5 million on Facebook, or actually 1.9 million last month um, on Facebook alone and hundreds of millions more through documentaries and podcasts and radios and speaking around the world and stuff like that. So it's just become this enormous thing that I never imagined before and it's very exciting because the moms that we work with are so passionate, so committed, so dedicated, and so effective, and we are transforming the food system, and there is a lot of good that's happening, and I hope everybody's really excited about the progress we're making, because the one thing I want you to know 
is that you can accomplish way more than you can imagine. And you are amazing, and I'm so glad that you're here. I'm a student of the soil. The more I know, the more I know I don't know. And I am passionate about producing nutrient-dense food that is beneficial for the soil, for the animals, for the consumers, and for the farmer. Because the farmers are in trouble. book Seeds of Deception, I would always ask the question, what was your most shocking moment? Because my attitude was that at the time people didn't know what a GMO was, people were not particularly interested in science, and I wanted to tell the story through stories. And I got some really doozy shocking moments. Now, each of you have been working, exposing a corrupt system and offering solutions. Let's ignore the solutions for a moment and give us your most uh, vivid example or what shocked you the most about the system that you would like to see changed. And you know, something visceral, proper, perhaps something you never shared in public before, but what really knocked you and said, wow, that's amazing. If anyone can speak and start and if you don't start, I'll just assign it. <laughs> I've been privileged to work with countless crop and livestock farmers across the U.S. and Canada. And amazing, amazing colleagues, scientists, researchers, MDs. I was watching Jeffrey interview Dr. Michael McNeil in the latest Healing GMO series that he did. And Dr. McNeil shared the comparison study that they did on a total non-GMO diet and clean rock with no glyphosate in the water in a hawk confinement unit in Iowa. And I had a flashback to a moment that I had in South Dakota with one of the Hutterite colonies that I was privileged to work with. And we had convinced them that they needed to get off of GMOs to improve the herd health of the livestock they raised. It was primarily hogs, but they also had turkeys and cattle. And I knew that 
what we were telling them to do was sinking in and making sense. And if you know the Hunter X, you know they count dollars and cents, not just cents. And after they started to see the improvements of switching to non-GMO corn, the proof that it was working was they were driving 144 miles one way to pick up this corn. Well, they wouldn't do that if it was not benefiting them. And I, however many months later, they show me the computer printout on how their pig production had increased dramatically. The increase they had in less than nine months was more than you could anticipate in a year's time. And I, from that point forward, I kept telling them, you've got to switch back. You have to go back. You have to go back. And they just looked at me like, you know, they gave me the same look that they gave me when I told them they had to get off of it. So they held a winter conference and Dr. Wayne Ingham came, came in to speak at that conference on soil health. And when I heard Lane was coming, she's a good friend of mine, I called her and I says, hey, I'll pick you up at the airport. And we arrive at the colony and, and we come in and I introduce her to the boss. And after I introduced her to the boss, he's talking to Elaine and he slaps me on the shoulder with his hand and he says, yes, yeah, because of this clown here that we quit feeding GMOs to our livestock. And I says, yeah, and he won't prove that it really works because you won't switch back just for a little while. And he turned and looked at me and he said, we know how to do math. <laughs> he said, we have $250,000 a year more money in our checking account because of the change that we made. And if you want us to do your little experiment, you just lay your checkbook down on the table and make that check out. <laughs> So, when Jeffrey was interviewing Michael, that came back to me. And the shocking thing is what has become the new normal amongst livestock production. When Dr. McNeil said, 400 pigs dead out of 2,000 is normal, where have we got it? Okay. Thank you very much, Howard. I will be, thank you. I will be uh, reviewing some of the main points from the Healing from GMOs and Roundup series at 7 o'clock during my keynote, including the rest of the story with Mike McNeil. And about those hunterites, there's three types of people, Howard, those that know math and those that don't. Okay. Oh, would you like to go? I guess for me, something that was surprising through the, the 10 years I spent making my film, well, first I'll start with something that wasn't surprising, which was um, that the amount of people that wouldn't speak to me, that wouldn't um, be interviewed for the film, and they were the usual suspects, so Monsanto Bear, um, you know, uh, I came here to California to film around um, the time of the vote on Prop 37, um, and I interviewed so many people who were working so hard on Prop 37, and it, I worked very hard to get to finally get an interview with the um, the no on Prop 37 side, um, and finally got it. I, I hired a cinematographer. I drove to Sacramento. I did the interview, and then at the end of the interview, um, she wouldn't sign my release form. And she said, "Oh, actually, like, I don't want you to use this in a film." So. Um, there were, it was very hard to get um, uh, people who are on the pro-GMO side or who are um, uh, against the labeling of GMOs. It was really hard to get them to talk to me. But what, all that wasn't that shocking to me. But what was shocking is that um, our own regulatory body in Canada that regulates GMOs, which is Health Canada, which is the equivalent of your FDA, um, and you know, that is our regulatory agency that is funded by taxpayers' money. Um, I wanted them to just on camera explain how GMOs are regulated for the film. And it took me three months of, of calling them several times a week 
for, for, for three months' time and being transferred from you know, one department to the other to the other and being told, oh yeah, we'll definitely, we'll do this interview, no problem, you need to talk to this person, okay, no, actually, you need to talk to this person. Anyway, long story short, at the end of the three months, um, it was a flat out no, and there was no one at Health Canada who would actually go on camera and answer very, very basic questions about how GMOs are regulated in Canada. And to me, that was absolutely shocking and appalling, and it's, um, it really is kind of the heart of what my documentary is about, is this, this real lack of just basic information and transparency and access to information around um, this new technology that, that is in our, in our foods. So. Well, this is a tough question because there's a, a lot that has been shocking in the past five years about um, how we've been betrayed, you know, by the federal government, um, just the shenanigans going on with corporations. Um, but uh, having a spy intern come to my house, I mean, there's just been a lot of really disturbing things that have happened, you know, my, been attacked by trolls, all kinds, you know, I'm sure, yeah, Rachel knows about that. So there's been a lot of really shocking things, but I think the thing that I was most shocked about, and I know this is not your issue, Jeffrey, but finding glyphosate in all five childhood vaccines that we sent out to be testing was extremely shocking to me because even just the idea of it is shocking, but statistically, it, that is very unusual. We sent out 20 samples of Pediasure to be tested for glyphosate, and only six of them came back positive. You know, usually when you test a batch of something, some are positive and some are not. But um, all five childhood vaccines were positive, and the MMR vaccine was the highest. It was 25 uh, times higher in glyphosate than the other vaccines. And wow. another scientist followed up and tested 14 vaccines, and his MMR vaccines were 34 times higher in glyphosate. And MMR is the one that a CDC whistleblower, uh, William Thompson, pointed out, and he actually worked at the CDC, and he said the MMR is the one that was connected to causing autism, and that the CDC had covered it up. And which was even more shocking was when I asked the FDA and the CDC to respond to these screenings. These were initial preliminary, preliminary screenings. They weren't done with you know, HPLC mass spectrometry testing to you know, really super accurate uh, testing. Um, I wanted them to do that, right? That cost a lot of money and the methodology needs to be developed and all that. And of course they said no, and a year later when I did a Freedom of Information Act to find out maybe they had tested and they just didn't want to tell us, I got back 50% of the pages I got back were redacted. So they said they had the right to basically not disclose their inner conversations about uh, this topic. So. I find it incredibly shocking that our FDA and our CDC know that there's a weed killer in vaccines, or there may be a weed killer in many vaccines, and they are doing nothing about it. And the problem with this is that glyphosate increases the harmful impact of other toxins. So we know that there's you know, aluminum in many vaccines, there's mercury in some, like the flu vaccine. And, um, and we know that children are being damaged shortly after vaccines. It is happening and it's being ignored and it's, it's an utter disgrace of our regulatory agency. And I, I continue to be shocked that they continue to do nothing about it. Uh, for me, I think it's similar. There's a, there's a lot of things that were very shocking at the beginning, finding out the GMOs were still not labeled in, I'm from Canada, I'm from, you know, in Canada or the United States. Uh, that was one of the things that first got me interested in this movement is the fact that we still don't have the basic transparency, the basic right to choose what foods we want to put in our bodies. I think one of the things that shocked me the most is how far the biotech industry will go to push their message and to discredit anybody who talks out about the issues surrounding industrial agriculture or GMOs. And I think everybody on this panel knows and has experienced the typical trolls, the typical uh, people who will go after your, your personal background who understand um, that discrediting, it, uh, discrediting you is the only way that they can make themselves feel better about their product. And um, I had this on a personal experience after I debated Kevin O'Leary. I was 14 at the time. Um, I found out about a year later 
that what happened was Kevin Folta, uh, who is basically a mouthpiece for the pro-GMO industry, uh, was in communication with Ketchum, um, which is Monsanto's PR firm, and uh, because of U.S. right to know's motions to get this information released uh, and through the Freedom of Information Act, we were able to see that they were emailing back and forth about discrediting me um, at the age of 14 and trying to find ways to make me look bad to the public. And while I don't think age is a factor, I think everybody's equal and kids can speak out about issues that they're passionate about, there is something to be said about these corporations who are going after even young kids, uh, trying their best to discredit them and to try and make them look bad to the public. And that really stuck out to me, that as far as they'll go, using tactics to uh, attack young children. Um, and another thing is, they employed this as well as the let nothing go tactic, where they were going after every little thing activists, scientists, experts said uh, to try and make them look bad to the public, again, discrediting. Um, so really, their only tactic that they're employing now is not proving that their product is safe. Instead, it's trying to disprove anybody who says that they're not. And this is such an opposite reaction to what it should be. We should always make sure that our food is safe, our government should be looking out after us, and the reality is, is that they've done very little to nothing to make sure that our food is safe. Every single year, they increase daily allowable levels of glyphosate, of other toxic chemicals in our food system. They're constantly allowing GMOs uh, and other dangerous products to go through with very to little regulation, very little to no regulation. So these are big problems that, that I'm very concerned about. So, I'm sure that when we review these um, shocking moments, they're, they inspire some motivation. And we have shocking moments now in all areas of life, in our communities, etc. And the people on this panel have stepped up. They have done what Zen is, what, her, what she's passionate about, is taking community leaders and having them step onto a global stage. I don't know if you know who Kevin O'Leary is. He's national. He's a, he's a national talk, spokes or national talk show person in Canada, who's kind of a bully. <laughs> he's on Shark Tank. Okay, and um, you know, uh, Ob spent ten years creating a film together. Uh, I've seen how and Zen in different countries all over the world. They're, they're working on a global level. How many people here feel like there's an inspiration in them to step up their game? to do more for something that they're passionate about in the world. Raise your hand if that's true. So, most of you, that's terrific. Now, we have people on the panel who've made that leap, and I wanna ask you now, what inspiration you can give to the people in the audience that helped you, that you would have liked to have heard in your transition to stepping up to the higher, the higher game that you're playing? So when we lost Prop 37, I was in the parking lot with my family crying, and my nine-year-old son looked at me and said, you know, Mom, even Star Wars took six episodes. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yeah, they had Yoda. <laughs> like, really? Like, sometimes it's hard. And sometimes it's just time for a new episode. And what if this time I took on leadership? Like I took on that I'm the one to transform the food industry. Not me by myself, but I'm not waiting for somebody else to do it for me, right? I'm not gonna say, oh, somebody else will do this. And so I began to question, what would that look like? You know, what would, it looked like if I took on leadership, what would I do? What could I be uniquely capable of? What, you know, what could I do? And so that's where Moms Across America was born and began thinking about all of that leadership. So I would just invite you to think about, you know, if there's, if there's some place in your life that you're not complete with, you know, maybe you need to complete that episode. You know, talk about, debrief with somebody about that, get complete with that and then look at what it would look like to create a new episode and what kind of role you could take on 
And, uh, and I really do invite you to take on leadership, whether it's for your family, your church group, your preschool, your town, your state, your country, you know, whatever that is, because you, you're all uniquely qualified in some way to take on leadership in whatever it is that, that you care about. And, and know that uh, there are kids out there rooting you on and that believe in you. difficult, um, you can't do this, you can't, you don't have what it takes, you're never going to um, finish this project. Anyway, I don't need to go on because you, you all probably know what those voices sound like and I think that um, uh, sometimes we have to learn how to ignore those voices and just do the things that we want to do anyway. Um, I know that for me I never would have finished this film um, if, if I had listened to those voices and, and sometimes also um, we just, when we want to tackle a project, um, we, we all have our own time clock to do it. And for me, it took 10 years to make a film. I sometimes feel embarrassed about that, but um, the important thing is that I did it. And I think if, if, you're, if you're working on something, it's like, just don't give up. Just keep going and, um, and ignore those negative voices in your head. I guess I'll go next. Um, first of all, I just want to say, oh, you documented the entire movement for 10 years, and that is such an accomplishment. And that's why this film is so special, because it's documenting the entire GMO labeling movement, all of our struggles, to have the basic transparency to know what's in our food. And so, everyone go watch Modified. It's a great film. Um, but also, uh, I think, Something that everyone should know. Um, again, I think the general message here that you're going to hear from everyone is never give up, but understanding what the stakes are too. Everyone has to know that they play an equal and wonderful part in this movement. I mean, you see us up on this stage, and we've all obviously worked very hard to become activists and, and to be able to spread information, but every single one of us in this room is just as powerful. We all hold the exact same amount of uh, power in our hands to be able to make change in this world and whether that be in small ways or in large ways no one is asking you necessarily to be on the front lines all the time but please get active in even small ways sign petitions uh, they make a huger difference than you know um, get involved with organizations donate we're all lacking in funding um, there are so many small things that we can all do and at the end of the day all of these small things add up to momentous acts uh, together. At the end of the day, if we don't take action, it's the future generations that are going to suffer. And my generation, we've already had to deal with so many more issues than generations before us. We're struggling with the idea that we may not have pollinators 20 years from now. We're struggling with the idea that our rivers and oceans and lakes will be too contaminated to drink from, that our soils will be infertile because of genetic modification in our seeds and chemical agriculture. These are not worries that we should have to think about, and yet this is what we're facing right now. And that's why we need every single one of you to get involved, because without you, we can't do it. As the youth, we're constantly being told, you need to make a difference, you need to take action for your future now. And I couldn't agree more. The youth do need to take charge. But that's not saying that all of us as global citizens can't do things. All of us together need to take action because at the end of the day, this is all of our planet. We all share this beautiful earth. We are generation earth. We are not separated by our age barriers. Uh, and we all need to take action now. Ten years isn't that long. I, I started on the journey with GMOs in 1994. Started on the journey with the soil in 1989. And I'll be the first to admit, when I started 
telling people about GMO is what I had learned I did it wrong. I was using a hammer. And that didn't work. And, and it took me a while to figure out how to do it right. So 10 years wasn't long. And I think of all of the amazing people that I've been privileged to work with. I started communicating with Dr. Arpad Pustai in 2003. The first conversation I had with him on the phone, this was before I had taken the right attitude and mindset as far as putting the word out. He said to me, he says, I cannot believe how unknowing and uncaring the people in your country are about the food that they eat. My immediate thought, which I didn't say, thankfully, was, yeah, that gives a whole new meaning to fat, dumb, and happy. <laughs> I regret that I didn't learn sooner how to tell the story right, because that could have helped someone. I, in, in Dr. Pustai, Dr. Huber, Dr. Farrell, we talk about getting the message across. And it's tough. It's really tough when you understand this subject and you're passionate about it. And people just can't see it or won't listen. And then I've had countless conversations with Kathleen Halal, and again, she's got knowledge, she's got compassion, like Zen. And I, I have to go back to that conversation with Dr. Pustai. The flip side of it is, we can't even begin to comprehend what the cognitive capability could be of all of the people that we're trying to educate if they had good food. Because we're, we're hearing more and more incidences of this with children. And last night, Nicole had amazing information that she shared about how the diets and Zen shared about what happened with her son. And so we have to, we have to take the kinder, gentler approach and figure out the way to lead them instead of force them. Howard mentioned Don Huber and Michelle Perro, both in the audience, both complete heroes of the GMO movement. Can you both stand for a moment? So you can so I'm going to also answer the question that I asked, and I'm going to ask you the question next so you can think about it. You don't have to hear me. You can think about your answer to the next question. Because it started to actually percolate already when each of you were speaking. And I'm kind of caught between the two questions to give a life lesson that you got as a global leader and to give an insight into the solution that you're seeing now. I remember when I was at Bioneers and I saw Bill McKibben from 350.org get up and say the number one thing that people were thinking was going to be about, you know, carbon and whatnot is, was community. Somehow he had come to a place where his life lesson about the solution was the importance of community. And it, didn't, it wasn't obvious to him beforehand. So having taken this leap that you encourage the people in the audience to do, and what, wasn't that good advice, everyone? Yes. Wasn't that amazing? Okay. You can take that home. So having stepped up and, and had this level of accomplishment, then from this perspective, you can think, what is it the life lesson that you learned, or what is it the aspect about the solution to this problem that has dawned on you? It can be either one or a combination. I'll let you think about that while I answer the question. Okay, so what I, the, the thing that I want to say about stepping up into your higher calling, 
Someone uh, about an hour ago uh, went up to me and thanked me for my work and said, you're really courageous. And I actually don't believe that I'm courageous because courage requires fear. And you need courage to step through fear. But the life lesson that I have learned that I want to share with you in terms of stepping up into your higher expression is that when you actually surf on your higher mission, on your higher calling, you have the option to be fearless. You, you as if adopt a global persona, a global leadership role where there's no room for fear. You don't have to be brave. You step up and go, oh, this is why I'm here. This is my calling. This is what I choose to be. And there's something in that yes that can disperse and dispense with fear altogether and simply see the job, do the job, stay out of misery. So I want to give that as a lesson or as an option for people to choose in stepping into their higher calling. So now this complicated question that I put before you, does anyone have an answer they'd like to share? So I, I did feel fear at one point when I stepped into you know, being a leader for this national event for people to join into Fourth of July parades. And it was first the fear of failure, right? That it might not work, it might not happen, I might mess it up somehow. And then I managed to upset a global hacktivist group. And I didn't talk about it at the time because I didn't want any drama. But what happened was they wanted to march in the, in the 4th of July parades with masks on. And our moms did not want that. They didn't want masked men, you know, around anonymous men around their kids and being afraid. And it just wasn't the forum for that. And I invited them to join in, but without the masks. And they didn't like that. So they began harassing me and threatening me and dropping F-bombs and, you know, threatening to wipe out my family. And they, they have the capacity to do that. You know, they're, they pack, you know, people and bank accounts and all that kind of stuff. So I was really in an intense place of fear, and I was, um, it was uh, like 10 o'clock at night, I was in a tent in Connecticut, it was raining outside, one part of the tent was coming down, I was on my computer, and, and one of the uh, other um, activists knew that these people were, you know, coming after me, and she said, no, 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 this has to stop, because they were starting to go after other people too. And so she, she um, got them on, one of them on Facebook on a messaging. And she said, get on Facebook. You're going to message with them right now. She's on the phone with me. And so I, I got on, and they started doing their, your, you know, I paid opposition. You, you know, this, they just started their stuff, right? And I just stood my ground. And, and one of the things he said was that your husband works for this company. It's a long story, but has a medical device. It happened to be the gene gun was really not good, right? So my, my husband's company developed the gene gun, but it, he had nothing to do with it. He was an internet guy, he was technology, software, all this, sorry the story's become so long. But anyway, he, he was pointing to me that, you know, this company develops this, and I said, yes, but that gene gun is used to cure Alzheimer's and leukemia. It's like a pen, right? It can be used for good or evil, or like a Facebook page. And he had developed a Facebook page just to harass my husband and I, right? It was, it was our faces on it, it was World War Z, buildings collapsing, and they were doxing us. They were trying to come up with all of our stuff. And, uh, and so I said, but it's just like a Facebook page, right? It could be used for good or evil. And, and I, then I had a moment, and I said, very clever, by the way. I acknowledged what he did as clever, because there was some cleverness in the graphics that he had created and there was a pause and he said lol and all of the tension went away because i acknowledged him so one of the things that i have learned in taking on something big and having things happen you know stuff happens we get attacked if bad things happen things fall apart there's breakdowns the bridge can be acknowledgement to see something good in that other person, no matter what, and believe that they can come around is very powerful. 
So I invite you to never write anybody off. Not the politicians, not the guy at the meeting who says, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. Like, don't write anybody off, because if you do, you're the one saying that nothing else will ever be possible, right? Find something good in that person to acknowledge, and you can help create a bridge, and then something else will be possible. That guy not only took down that Facebook page, but he gave me information on Monsanto employees, like all of them, <laughs> that if I had used it, would have been you know, really bad, but I didn't, and, um, you know, because I don't know how accurate it is or where he got it or whatever, but he became, you know, one of our biggest allies and said, if you ever need anything, we're here for you, like all of that. We completely turned that situation around. So find something good in people. Yeah. Uh, that when we work to change the world, which is, there's so much to change about the world right now, and, and we fight these huge battles that are, can be, can take forever to win, or that can just really suck the life energy out of us. And I think that, um, for me, and again, I'm going back to my mom, <laughs> um, but my mom was a, a huge food activist, and she was very, um, like rah, 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 and very active, but she always came back to her garden and to the pleasure of cooking and of sharing meals together. And I think that when we're um, working on things, we, we have to remember to take care of ourselves and to enjoy our lives and to enjoy, and especially when we're working on food issues, we have to remember to just enjoy food and just um, take the time to eat together, to cook, to, to enjoy what it is that we're fighting for, because we're fighting for good food. And so we have to, um, to yeah, to, take, to allow ourselves to take the, the pleasure, um, to take pleasure into our lives, and, and, and that can be in different, not just related to food, but in different um, areas as well. I'm going to give you my life lessons. Um, <laughs> I think it goes back to what I was saying before, is not hesitating. It can be easy, like uh, like we were talking about earlier, to let fear consume you, and it, it happens. I think everybody in this movement has their story about, um, you know, being attacked by trolls or by being imitated on Facebook or, or threatened or harassed. And it happens to everyone who try and steps, uh, tries to step up. And I think where I'm going with this is there's always going to be opposition. No matter what you're passionate about, no matter what you care about, there is always going to be some form of opposition, someone who opposes what you do. And you can't let this get in the way of what you love, um, especially in this food movement where going up against corporations that have billions of dollars, we have Monsanto and Bayer merging. We have, um, you know, them spending millions on tactics to try and deceive consumers and fight against mandatory GMO labeling and spin out propaganda about how they're really saving the world and fixing climate change and feeding everyone. And it can seem overwhelming and it can seem very hard to deal with. And I guess the big life lesson here is don't let that overwhelm you. Know that even through your small actions, even through voting with your dollar, even through deciding to eat organic rather than eating at McDonald's, you're having an impact on the ecosystem that is our planet. Um, and whether you realize it or not, every single decision you make is having a, a global impact. So please keep that in mind and know that no matter what anybody says, no matter what adversaries you may find, uh, as long as you believe in what you're saying and as long as you continue with your message, you're always going to get a lot further and know that you always have support. Find your community. You are mentioning community earlier. Knowing that if you find your community, you can find a place that is like your home, a place where you can really create real change. I know I had a very difficult time in, in high school, weeks on end. It was a very, very challenging thing for me. But no matter what adversaries I found, no matter what opposition,
opposition that I face, uh, you continue forward because this is what this movement is all about. It's through triumphing over the billions of dollars that these corporations may have and realizing that in reality, all, every single one of us has the power. I wish I had a, an idea of how many places I've been privileged to speak on the subject of GMOs. But Jeffrey's comment about fear, probably the most hostile audience I've ever spoken to was in Canada. Potentially hostile audience, I should say. <laughs> the farmer asked me to come up and, and speak. And 